Well, thank you for joining us. I think, you know, um, one of the things that uh, Dr. Hamry, the president of CSIS, has talked about is how so many of the issues today are horizontal, but governments are vertical. And I think Sherpas, uh, and one of our goals in convening them, have probably a better perspective, both of the difficulties in organizing the U.S. government to address things, but also in terms of working together to confront multilateral issues. And we're really pleased to have here at this first Sherpa Summit some of those that have been here at some of the most critical junctures for the G system um, and showed real leadership through that process. And I've had the pleasure of working with, uh, I guess, three of the four, and one I know very well from reputation from his great work under Secretary Rubin and, and also someone that we hear a lot about these days, uh, Secretary Summers, who is immersed deeply in this, the midst of this uh, global crisis. So I'd like to briefly introduce them and ask them to make uh, brief remarks from the table, and then we will turn to the crowd for, for again, for your questions um, on these various issues. Um, Gary Edson, I've had the pleasure of working with in, in different capacities, and I think as I've talked to many Sherpas, many have commented on both his kind of leadership and his vision and creativity in addressing many issues. And he was there at a, a, a very critical juncture as the G8 confronted uh, the attacks of 9-11 that transformed them in many ways and, and brought a new focus on security and other issues. But I guess as a Renaissance man, Gary also broke new ground in terms of PEPFAR, in terms of some of the global development issues that were launched during his time as Sherpa at the G8. So it's a pleasure to have him here with us today and also to tap into his expertise as an entrepreneur and a, and a business leader as well. So we very much welcome you today. <coughs> Second, to his left we have Jeff Schaefer who was Undersecretary of the Treasury for International. Again, as I mentioned, served under some legendary officials at some very critical times as we struggled to adapt to the uh, wake of the Cold War, uh, the Asian financial crisis, and, and the kernels. He said that the G20 hadn't quite launched while he was there, but the inklings of, of what would become the, uh, the G20. He also has phenomenal business experience, including working at Citibank, uh, so has a, the added perspective of seeing the global financial crisis from the front lines, which I think will be invaluable in, the day, in, in this discussion. Uh, next, we have uh, Mike Dan Price, who is in many ways the father of the G20 uh, leader summits, launching them in the wake of the global financial crisis, um, moving forward with uh, this bold reform plan and also having been a leader in trade in, in, in both at USTR, where I'm pleased to see that we're joined by Ambassador Carla Hills, who contributed both Dan and Gary, in a sense, from her team at USTR uh, and a kind of a legendary period for U.S. trade. So we're very honored to have Dan here and to hear his perspective. And last but not least, Ambassador Al Larson, who I've also had the great pleasure of working with. I believe Al may have been the only ambassador that, or the only undersecretary that was retained between the Clinton administration and the Bush administration, which I believe shows how indispensable he was to these processes. And as we were talking today at lunch, um, we were talking about Sherpas and, and kind of the, what that means. And he actually said he started out as what was known as a yak, uh, supporting a Sherpa in the Carter administration. So, uh, so we, we, he's seen this from very many different perspectives and how it's evolved and has been a real leader, including in many development initiatives, including the Millennium Challenge Corporation and taking a new approach and has seen it, some of the biggest issues that the State Department deals with, including climate change. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Gary and for brief comments from all of our Sherpas, ask them to focus on, you know, again, what they think is the most important issues facing us as we face the Pittsburgh Summit and then also based on their experience where they think the G system and international coordination needs to go from here. So thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that you decided to have the ambassadors panel go first because it, it proves what I've been claiming for a long time, which is that at least in some countries, being Sherpa is considered an honor. <laughs> which, which, which reminds me of a very vivid recollection of a National Security Council meeting in the White House Situation Room, and a G8 issue arose, and somebody in passing made reference to, quote, our Sherpa, uh, at which point uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld leaned back, looked at the ceiling, and, and asked it of no one in particular, what the hell's a Sherpa? Uh, until then, I don't think I truly appreciated the meaning of the word mortified, uh, uh, but, but, but I believe that shortly before I lost consciousness, I, I, I replied, beats me. 
Uh, of course, the, the, the real honor of being a Sherpa was, was serving alongside people like, like Al Larson. Uh, we didn't have the honor, but one day we might. Uh, and sitting across the table from folks like Ambassadors Castellaneta and Fujisaki and being succeeded, uh, eclipsed, by people like Dan Price and Mike Froman. Uh, as, as Ambassador Castellaneta mentioned, and as folks have made passing reference to, the G8 has been shaped by crises. It was born, in effect, out of the, the oil shocks and, and economic crises of the 1970s and is now being reshaped, potentially erased, uh, by the current economic crisis. In between, as Steve mentioned, of course, came 9-11. As, the pres as President Bush said at the time, in great tragedy, there's often great opportunity. I like to believe that we, and I mean that collectively, the G8 collectively, took that opportunity and used it to remake the G8 for the better. Uh, first, we made the outcomes, or tried to make the outcomes, more action-oriented, moving the G8 from conversation to commitment and from posturing to promise-making. Of course, Promise keeping became a challenge then and still is, but the shift to action I think was significant. Second, we expanded the agenda beyond the traditional economic and foreign policy issues to directly address key security and national security concerns, even some very tough and technical ones. I, I ought to add, in light of Ambassador Fujisaki's new role, that in 2003, we expanded the APEC agenda to include, specifically include, security concerns as well. Third, recognizing in the wake of 9-11 the link between security and development, that, that failed states and impoverished nations can come prey to internal conflict as well as external terror. We expanded the agenda to address key global development issues, from famine relief and food security to HIV and malaria, and Al can speak more, more to that. And finally, as a consequence of all these changes, we expanded the circle of engagement uh, to the point, to the question about the G8 being a rich man's club. Uh, we expanded the circle of engagement to encompass, through so-called outreach, not only the poorest developing nations, but also the emerging powers. In that course of events, I view 2002 and 2003 as watershed years. The Canadian hosted Kananaskis Summit uh, in 2002, and now we're in 2010, uh, approaching the 10 years after that. The Kananaskis Canana Summit produced significant action plans on transportation security and nuclear proliferation. By the way, uh, you mentioned Ambassador Hills uh, taking a leaf from her book. Uh, uh, there is no action unless you stipulate who does what by when. Uh, Madam Ambassador, you set the bar high. Uh, we aimed for it. We didn't always achieve it. But I think if you look at what came out of that summit, it, it's a significant shift from prior summits. Ken and Askus also produced the G8 Africa Action Plan, which replaced the old donor-recipient paradigm with a notion embodied in the Millennium Challenge Corporation and the Monterey Consensus of a true partnership between developed and developing countries. Uh, as an aside, I think uh, the Canadian Sherpa at the time, Ambassador Bob Fowler, deserves enormous credit for the success of that summit. At the French summit the following year, the agenda was expanded to directly address clean energy and uh, environmental concerns, including climate. And the outreach uh, was expanded to include virtually all of what, what are the G20 countries. As a result of those changes, I think the G8 became a more robust and action-oriented vehicle. I think it also became a flexible one with a de facto membership that expanded and contracted depending on the issues, in effect, form followed function. Uh, in conclusion, let me just say if, if the G8 should be replaced by a G20 or a GX, uh, and I'll let the others speak to that, my prediction, based on my own experience, is that uh, the altitude at which Sherpa's work will approach the death zone, uh, the supplemental oxygen will absolutely be required, and, and the need for patience will go well beyond uh, whatever I could show or did muster. Thank you. Secretary Shea. Twenty years ago, I wrote that one should ask not what G7 summits decide, but what direction they point in. A summit is only one point on a landscape through which we must find our way. 
And I believe this is the right way to think about the Pittsburgh G20 summit that's coming up. The contours of the international political landscape have changed a lot since I wrote that. One of the most significant legacies of the recent crisis was the Create a G20 summit that now towers over what I had thought was a long outdated G7, G8 summit structure. The G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meetings, which were created in the late 1990s, have consequently come to occupy the critical path to these summits. And another 1990s innovation, the Financial Stability Forum, which proved a disappointment in failing to identify the systemic risks that were realized with such tremendous force over the past two years, has been reconstituted and hopefully invigorated as the Financial Stability Board and is reporting to the Pittsburgh meeting. My observation still holds. I hope for a clear sense of direction, but expect little by way of really important concrete operational agreements to come out of Pittsburgh. And I don't think this should be seen as a disappointment. The meeting has not even taken place yet, but it has already played an important role in providing a goal to those following the paths through the valley, over the foothills, and up the slope to the summit. The work has been going on in a number of groups, including the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors, the Financial Stability Board, the IMF and World Bank Executive Boards, the Basel Committee of Bank Supervisors, and others. This is all important work. And they've been responding to directions given at the previous G20 summit in London in April. And I expect there will be a sense of moving forward from the groups that have been working and that will deliver reports. The big accomplishment at this meeting will be the revived confidence in the global economy. The London summit took place at a time when fear seized markets and, and the public. We've almost forgotten how frightened we were in April. Stock markets had been on a vertiginous slide until just two weeks earlier, and no one knew whether it was over or not. U.S. housing prices were falling at an undiminished rate. The most recent data showed global trade falling faster than anyone could remember. And there were few, if any, anecdotes to suggest an end. Jobs were disappearing. In retrospect, the meeting took place at about the darkest day. Policy action had been taken to counter financial distress and economic contraction, with international consultations playing a role, I think an important role, going back to the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting in October of last year and the first G20 summit in Washington the following month. Governments have been lenders of last resort, that is, they've done quantitative easing, and they have been spenders of last resort, that is, they've done financial stimulus. These policies have gained traction and the results are visible. Banks are willing to do business with one another and the spread in the interbank market has come down. Global bond markets are wide open at attractive rates for the issuance of both investment grade and high yield bonds. Equities have rebounded with U.S., European and emerging market indices all up by roughly 50 percent from those dark days in March. Housing prices in the U.S. have leveled off and sales are picking up. Economic activity is visibly strengthening with indicators pointing to surprisingly strong third quarter growth in the United States, with China gaining further momentum and growth resuming, resuming in the Euro area, the UK, Canada, Brazil, Korea, and elsewhere. The heads of state and government will deservedly call attention to this turnaround, but it should mark a transition in their efforts, not a declaration of victory. The main things to look for in the three areas of focus for the meeting, or the three areas I would focus on for the meeting, are as follows. First, sustaining recovery. The leaders are unlikely to make the mistake of concluding that the recovery is assured. The growth we are sensing now is largely the upside of a violent inventory cycle, and looking beyond this quarter or next, growth is at risk of falling back in most countries as consumer and business caution restrains consumption and investment demand. So there is going to be the need for continued demand support. But if we look further ahead, there are a lot of countries led by the United States, the UK, and Japan that have fiscal trajectories that are simply unsustainable and bear the seeds of future crises. A credible focus on this challenge is also critical. And related to this is the need for commitment to do what is required to continue to narrow huge current account imbalances. They will widen again with disastrous consequences if leaders take a business-as-usual approach. And while it may be too soon to rely solely on the recovering private financial system to provide adequate credit intermediation channels, plans to reverse the quantitative easing that central banks have done in an orderly way 
will have to be formulated soon in order to maintain confidence that the world is not headed towards inflation. Central banks are and should be independent, but encouragement from the leaders to prepare for reversal is important to reassure markets. So we need a coordinated exit strategy planning process that the leaders focus on. And this message would strengthen confidence that demand support will not be withdrawn prematurely, but that processes are in place to shrink the outside imba outsized imbalances. At the same time, as others have said, there has to be intention on the fundamentals going forward for prosperity, that is, attention to the international, protecting the international trade regime, investment regime, and domestic reforms. The second area of focus is financial reform. Last October, I thought it was premature to address seriously the reform of the financial supervision and regulation, and even in April it was difficult to look beyond the immediate crisis to the task of building a more stable global financial system. But now is the time. National authorities have had an opportunity to draw lessons from the crisis. Specialized groups like the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board do have work to report, and the public debate is in full swing. And the stakes here are high. Financial regulation is and realistically must be a responsibility of sovereign authorities. And that leaves some ambiguity as to what can done, be done within the EU and the euro area. But this can't be done by a global group. And national government, because national governments have the accountability and the fiscal responsibility that's essential for legitimacy in this area. But the markets are global, and so too are the major institutions that take part in them. So the tension in this inconsistency can only be contained if there is strong and deep global cooperation and coordination. And the work has to go forward, and the specific agreements have to be reached in more technical groups than a summit. And the four areas in which I understand the FSB will be responding on, uh, where internationally coordinated approaches will be especially important to create stable financial environment for the future, are first, coordination of systemic oversight to identify threats. We need a global view from those whose job it is to recognize what could go wrong. Second, coordination of oversight of systemically important global financial institutions. This is critically important to effectively identify and contain risks. As somebody who works in one of these institutions, it's all so critical so that we can serve our clients without encountering inconsistent and incoherent requirements from different authorities. Third, resolution procedures for global financial institutions have to be worked out. The U.S. authorities have recognized the need to have means to take over financial institutions in addition to banks in ways that provide a more favorable trade-off between taxpayer expense and systemic stability than we can have now or that we had last September when we went one way with Lehman and the other way with AIG, both of which were very costly. Since the relevant institutions are likely to have multinational presence, this is going to be an important area for international cooperation. And fourth, we need a global approach to capital and liquidity. We're beginning to see a proliferation of local capital and liquidity requirements that runs a risk of creating national silos. This will mean higher credit costs everywhere and much higher and more unstable costs in some markets, especially for global businesses who need the services of global institutions. Capital and liquidity requirements need to be reassessed in light of what has happened, but if this is done country by country rather than globally, the result will be greater financial rigidity. Now, the agenda is much broader than the points I've, I've identified, uh, but there are some important financial issues, derivatives market regulation, for example, that are much too technical, I think, to be more than flagged at the summit level. And some others carry more political weight than import for the future stability of the system and how much I'm going to get paid, for example, I would put in that category. The areas that I have highlighted are the ones where the leaders can do most to improve financial stability and strength by giving direction to the export groups that have to carry this work forward. The third area uh, that I focus on for this meeting is the international architecture. The reform of the IMF and World Bank governance will be on the agenda, and it's long overdue. I tried to give this some impetus when I was at the Treasury in the early 1990s, but made very little progress. The crisis have, has given glacially moving reform some impetus. But the critical needs are to reweight governance structures to reflect the large changes in global economic and financial power that have taken place. And I disagree with the person who asked the question over here who says it hasn't happened. 
if it hasn't happened yet, it'll happen within a quarter or two that China will become the second <clears throat> largest economy in the world without taking PPP into account. Uh, and uh, nobody can say that they're rightly reflected. It is Europe that is way overweighted in these institutions uh, currently. Um, but the need to address this and to bring the governance of these institutions in line with reality is important. And there is a risk that as the crisis passes, the momentum behind change will run down. And the G20 summit, which has brought emerging market leaders to the table, can play a critical role in keeping this from happening. These are the key directions that I'm going to be looking to uh, the Pittsburgh meeting to provide direction on. But we've got to keep our eyes on what happens on the slopes and in the valleys between summits. This is where the FSB, the Basel Committee, the IMF, the World Bank, this is where the essential agreements on cooperation, I think, are going to have to be worked out. Thank you. Secretary Schaefer, thank you for those insights on financial markets. Next, we turn to Dan Price, who, again, is the person that launched the G20 summits, I think, has an unequaled perspective on, uh, on how they were generated and potentially the way forward. Thank, thank you for joining us, Dan. Thank you, Steve. I think it's still too early to decide whether I wish to claim parentage. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is uh, address three things. First, why G20? Why did we decide to have a leader's level at G20 uh, in the fall of 2008? Second, uh, ask uh, what are the merits of that forum? What have these summits accomplished? Uh, give an overview of that. And third, what are the current challenges? Uh, in particular, uh, some of the challenges that will be faced in Pittsburgh, but challenges to the functioning of the G20 at leaders' level. First, why G20? Cast your mind back to the fall of 2008, not that long ago. Virtually every day in many countries, there was breaking news of failing or stressed financial institutions, uh, declines in stock market indices. It was uh, a, a, a crisis where event after event was breaking, uh, certainly in the major financial centers, but more broadly. Uh, and there was a sense, uh, if not of panic, uh, broadly uh, I in the globe, then certainly a, a great deal of uncertainty and concern about where the bottom was, what the repercussions would be, uh, and how are we going to manage ourselves to deal with what first appeared to be a financial crisis, but was rapidly morphing into a uh, more broadly based economic crisis. Uh, President Bush decided that it was going to be important to gather leaders together to address this. The question was, when do you hold a summit with events breaking on a daily basis? and the finance ministers, whose input would be critical, pretty much preoccupied on a day-to-day -day basis with other things. So when do you hold that summit, and who should be there? Some of our European colleagues uh, believed that the summit should be held among a relatively small group of countries, say the G7 or G8 plus a few major emerging markets. The president felt very strongly that a leaders' meeting had to be broadly representative of both developed and developing countries. After all, while the crisis may have been felt at that moment, principally in the developed world, it was rapidly affecting developing countries as well. So too, for legitimacy purposes, any blueprint for economic or financial reform, in order to enjoy broad support, needed to be endorsed, discussed, and endorsed by a broad group of leaders. So after uh, his consultations with a number of heads of state, uh, the president announced uh, the holding of a leader summit at the G20 level. Uh, sorry, uh, a leader summit among the G20. And why G20? It was a broadly representative group. It was a group that existed. It had the merits of not having to decide ad hoc who should come, who should not come. There was some institutional history 
uh, among the finance ministry channels uh, as they had met annually since 1997. So it made sense, uh, as Ambassador Fujisaki, I think, said, uh, as, as a matter of first response to hold this at the G20 level. So that's the origin. What were the benefits of doing this? Uh, I would say uh, two things. First, look at the deliverables from that initial Washington summit. It was a broad statement of principles and a 47-point action plan laying out specific actions in the financial regulatory reform area and reform of international institutions. We had about roughly four weeks from the time the summit was announced till the time it was held to put this together. And uh, in a certain sense, uh, we had Mike Froman at lunch. I feel bad that Mike Froman has had so much time, right? Uh, there was something about the compressed time frame, the real sense of crisis that helped bring countries together. How else would one have imagined that such a diverse group of countries in such a short period of time would express support for open and competitive markets, for the importance of private property and respect for the rule of law, for rejecting protectionism, rejecting taking measures even if permitted by the WTO. How else could one have expected such rapid consensus on reform of international financial institutions? As Jeff said, this issue had been around for years. Or the expansion of the Financial Stability Forum to the Financial Stability Board. Importantly, having the involvement of the major emerging uh, countries, uh, as well as other developing countries, changed the dynamic of the discussion. It was no longer as summits often are characterized by just transatlantic tips. Uh, and I would say that the major emerging market uh, Sherpas, at least in the discussions among Sherpas, played a very constructive role in moderating the tensions either among European countries or between Europe and the United States. And as the host Sherpa, I certainly welcome that. Uh, so, uh, and also a number of critical insights came from the emerging market participants. You'll recall in the Washington Summit Declaration that there's a cautionary note about the risk of overregulation and the risk of an overreaction to the crisis. That was put in there by the representatives of the major emerging markets who said, we know how you are in the West. Mm -hmm. You have a crisis, you overreact, and in the end, it's we, the developing countries, who suffer from your overreaction. Very, very helpful. So I, I would say there uh, are uh, many benefits to having a leaders forum address global financial and economic issues uh, at uh, the, the, the G20 level with such a representative group. Uh, let me take a moment and talk about some of the current challenges. And, and as I say, current challenges for the G20, not just for Pittsburgh. The first is accountability. What are the mechanisms that you put in place to ensure that you keep the promises you've made, whether those promises are in the form of writing checks or in the form of not enacting protectionist measures. What body, what entity is seized with responsibility? And how do you ensure that you actually carry out what you say you're going to do, including in the regulatory reform area? How do you ensure that where you've agreed a sense of principles, a set of principles, whether it's on capital adequacy or, 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 or liquidity or bringing uh, uh, derivatives onto uh, exchanges, how do you ensure that the resulting domestic legislation is consistent with those agreed principles? So first is accountability. Uh, the second, I think, is protectionism broadly defined. Not just trade protectionism, but a general turning inward on recovery and reform efforts. We're by now familiar with this in connection with economic stimulus plans that may favor local products, 
that may uh, favor the purchase of local products or subsidize local purchase. Less familiar but uh, growing uh, uh, ever more present are protectionist measures in the financial regulatory reform area. As countries begin the process of addressing systemic risk and pushing forward on financial recovery, too often they're looking at it on a solely national basis, with the consequence that, for example, the Swiss have adopted leverage limits that exclude from the leverage calculation the entire domestic loan book. That discourages lending abroad. The Europeans have adopted uh, or proposed regulations on investment funds that say if you want access to the institutional investors in Europe, you must be physically present, authorized, licensed by us. So what we see in these things, uh, in effect, is a deglobalization that notwithstanding all of the good statements about cooperation and the need to work together, that when it comes to the tough stuff of regulatory reform or economic recovery, there is that urge, there is that political urge uh, to do it without regard to its impact on global capital markets or global supply chains. Um, final risk, and this is a risk before any summit. There's really, really important work to do. Uh, Jeff outlined, uh, I, I, I thought very well, the important work to be done on institutional reform, regulatory reform, uh, charting uh, a new uh, approach to sustainable growth. But it's always the case before each of these summits, there's some drumbeat on an issue that bears only a marginal relationship to the real work of reform. Before the Washington summit, it was about unregulated hedge funds. Before the London summit, it was about tax havens. Before the Pittsburgh summit, it appears to be about bankers' bonuses. Now, while all of these are legitimate topics for discussion, I, I, I don't think anyone would agree that these particular issues were principal causes of the crisis. Compensation is but a piece of the puzzle and I would suggest not the most important piece. But it's also a piece on which there is a great deal of consensus. The FSB has adopted principles uh, that I think are broadly shared uh, on compensation uh, that aim at the issue of risk, that discourage excessive risk taking, that tie compensation to the longer term performance uh, of the enterprise, ensure that uh, compensation is paid out over time, subject to clawback uh, if performance uh, uh, deteriorates. But to kind of go farther and advocate an absolute cap, either a number or a fixed ratio, uh, fortunately President Obama and his advisors are on record uh, opposing that, uh, and, and, and rightly so. Uh, so as I say, the final risk is that there is the possibility as you run up to these things that something kind of hijacks the attention uh, and becomes a distraction from the important work of reform. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And now we turn to Ambassador Alan Larson, who has, I think, a terrific perspective from so many different angles, being seen this through so many administrations, through his work in the OECD, working with many of these governments. And I look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. I um, would like to broaden the lens a little bit and talk in a more general way for a few moments about why the G process has played such an important role in the governance of globalization and why it will continue to, in my estimation. Um, the G process has been responsive to new challenges, and it has addressed over the last 30 years exchange rate issues, uh, international poverty issues, international security issues after 9-11, and energy security issues. Um, it has been a less formal process than many, and one of the things that is most notable about it is that leaders and Sherpas engage in real discourse and real negotiation, unlike what happens for the most part in the United Nations. 
And, uh, you know, there's an anecdote about President Reagan going to his first summit and being shocked that people were starting to talk about the communique even though the meeting had just begun. And, and he sort of rightly said he thought that this was a little bit out of sync. Now, the fact of the matter is draft communiques have been written and will continue to be written for the most part before the meeting by Sherpa. <coughs> but what, what President Reagan, I think, was rightly stressing is let's have a real exchange. Let's not sit down here and try to wordsmith a document. And when that principle has been respected, the quality of discussion in these fora has been tremendously valuable in finding your way towards a good solution. Um, the accountability factor has been good at times, poor at times. I think Dan is right to emphasize it as a crucial factor going forward, and it's, it's something that um, I know my organization, Transparency International USA, has been prodding on and will continue uh, will continue to do so. Without getting too historical, I wanted to just comment a little bit about some of the types of issues that have been taken up in the G process. During, during the Carter administration, the first summit that I remember working on, there was a tremendous focus on oil import ceilings and targets because the issue then was how do we collectively reduce our dependence on imported oil in the wake of the oil embargoes and oil shocks of the 1970s. We can't agree on a universal import limit. We're not going to agree on a collective oil import tariff. But can we agree on what we each will do, what we think the result of those policies will be in terms of reduction of oil import dependence, and have a mechanism to keep ourselves accountable? Far from perfect solution, but it, it frankly maintained cohesion at a time when cohesion could have been lost. During the Reagan administration, uh, there was a focus on economic growth issues, again, a topic that is not going to go away, and on currency issues, the high value of the dollar. And we, I remember having very detailed discussions at the heads level, at the president, prime minister level, about structural adjustment, the need for economies to be flexible and responsive uh, to change. During the Bush administration, Bush one, I was in Paris for the most part at the OECD. And it's interesting to, you know, Jeff Schaefer mentioned the role of other international organizations during the valleys between summits. Um, I found that the work that the OECD did on issues like unemployment policies, policies to make economies more responsive to economic cycles and to be able to help the unemployed get back into the workforce as quickly as possible, to be a very significant contribution that fed in very helpfully to the summit deliberations during that period. And in many of these organizations, and the OECD was no, um, was no exception, you both made a very big contribution to the work of the summit, and you took close account of what the summits said because it helped give you a sense of what action plan might be best for your organization to ensure its relevance to the major issues of the day. During the Clinton administration, a lot of the focus in summits began to shift to issues of development. There was a deep concern about issues like the digital divide. You know, we're going through the dot-com boom, and everyone thought this is great for us, but developing countries are asked, how do we benefit, how do we ensure that this can contribute to our development prospects? The other big issue that emerged and I think was dealt with to some extent effectively was the issue of, of infectious diseases, mainly inspired by the HIV-AIDS crisis. During the Bush administration, um, under Gary's leadership, we, we actually got, I think, significantly more progress made on, on some of those issues. Gary's already spoken about the response to 9-11. Um, I'll only second what he said and say that the summit 
in 2002 at Kananaskis was the first summit and the only summit I ever attended that was actually in the mountains. And, um, and I think that the results that came out of that not only did a terrific job of setting out an agenda, but ensured, helped ensure that this wasn't an issue that created unnecessary divisions. You know, people, economists like me, like to talk about global public goods, things that, you know, their character is such that even a country as large as the United States can't consume them without working with other countries and without some burden sharing, and also global public bads, things that you can't prevent even a country like the United States on your own. You have to cooperate with others and to the extent that free riders aren't cooperating, there's very cost, it's very costly to the international system. And there's a very real sense in which the G process is dealing with global public goods and global public bads and trying to find out cooperative solutions to those, to those problems. I, I think one of the other major developmental initiatives that was notable um, during Bush 43 was the work that was done on infectious diseases and particularly in the Rome summit of, um, of 2001 on the Global Fund. This was a really good example of a situation where people at this very close range that, that Dan and Gary and and uh, Ambassador Castano Leda and Ambassador Fujisaki know, know so well where you hammered out not agreements that were internationally binding, but understandings that created some common ground among players that would have to play the leading role in pushing uh, for international consensus on these issues. And I think that's the great merit of the G process. Looking ahead, I, I wanted, you know, I said earlier, I think for better or worse, something like the G process is going to uh, continue to be an important and necessary part <coughs> of global governance of globalization. And I'll give two examples. You know, I talked about back in the Carter administration, the focus on energy policy. Uh, we're now in the run-up to Copenhagen and to a major international conference on how we deal with the challenge of global climate change and the, and the way that energy policy fits into that. I don't pretend to know how to read the tea leaves either in Copenhagen or what's going to go on a few blocks from here in Capitol Hill, but there's increasing talk about the fact that we may not have a climate legislation this year, we may go to Copenhagen without that. And I can easily imagine that part of the path forward could turn out to be a process where a G-something group gets together and tries to figure out, well, look, we're not all going to be able to do the same thing immediately because our domestic political situations won't permit that. But what can we do that is pushing in the same direction, that, that's broadly consistent and certainly not incompatible? How do we measure whether we're following through on those commitments, be they policy commitments or some other commitments? How do we measure the results of those commitments so that we have an accountability for what we're doing? And how is that a, perhaps a pathway towards a sort of more comprehensive and more elegant international framework on dealing with energy and climate? Uh, that's not a prediction, but it's just a, sort of a statement of the way in which a G process can be very helpful on other future major problems. Um, we've already talked briefly about economic and financial issues of the future. I, I, I'm in the optimistic camp that we will work our way, that we are working our way through the current crisis successfully in substantial part because of the ability of the G20 process under the leadership of Dan and uh, now Mike Froman, to keep the international, the major players, more or less on the same path forward when it comes to fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, financial regulation, and avoiding protectionism. But we still have to have growth. We still have to deal with the problems of the large U.S. deficits, uh, fiscal and current account. We have to deal with international imbalances. And it's, you know, it's not inconceivable that we'll have to have another summit that's really focused on some very, very tough uh, 
uh, currency, uh, current account and balance issues. And it's quite likely in my mind that if that future arrives, that it will be a, a G-type process that will lead the path forward to, to towards a solution, not to a solution, but in the direction and towards a solution. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for all of your comments. I, before I turn it over to the panel, I'd like to raise one quick question. Um, there's kind of the G20 process was born out of this global economic crisis where many people believed we could have headed over a cliff towards the next Great Depression. We know we've had extraordinary fiscal and monetary actions that have staved that off, but now there are voices saying that as the political momentum dies down, we're not doing enough robustly or quickly enough to prevent a financial crisis 2.0 or W-shaped recovery. Is your, in your opinion, are we doing enough both in substantively and quickly enough to avoid that kind of risk? And if not, what should we be doing about that? I mean, it's my view that one has done, one has been enough and as much or even more than one could realistically expect up until now. But this is a transition point. As I said, in, in April we were just in desperate straits. Now there is some sense of stability, and the question is, do we just pretend like it's over and go about our business, or do we recognize that we have all of these very serious problems still in front of us and refocus on those? And I think that we'll have to see what happens in the next six months to a year to see whether we do that or not. I agree with those who identify the improvement in the global economic situation as a risk to reform efforts. Uh, as I said, I mean, I, I do not think we would have been able to reach consensus as quickly as we did on both principles and specific action points, but for the pressure of the crisis. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, things are looking up does not mean the, that implementing the agenda is less important, but it will have less of a sense of urgency, uh, and, and uh, that is a problem. And one of the key things to come out of Pittsburgh will be re a renewed demonstration of political will among these leaders to implement that reform agenda. Sense, I guess, to paraphrase Rahm Emanuel, to make sure we don't waste a crisis in terms of using it to solve some of these things that are out there. With that, I'd like to turn it open to the crowd, uh, the one right here in the second row. Uh, thank you. My name is Paula Stern. Thank you very much for the presentations. They've all been excellent. Uh, and I'd like to kind of continue in my question the dialogue that you just started uh, about uh, the implementation the phase of the G2020's work, uh, specifically when it comes to uh, the trade uh, agenda and the agenda of uh, that organization uh, the World Trade Organization and possibly the OECD, given the fact that we've got a G20, it's a different type of a membership. Um, it's, it's been my view that um, the, G, uh, that, um, the WTO uh, and the, uh, has been underutilized, uh, that we only think about as a litmus test of the WTO and the World Trading System is whether the Doha round gets passed. And there are so many other uh, aspects of the WTO, uh, in particular re reviewing subsidies that have been uh, put into place as part of bailouts. Um, uh, there are other uh, opportunities, it seems to me, to deploy the WTO as an organization, just as we have seen the Financial Stability Board become more robust. We have not seen that kind of growth um, uh, which I think is important for uh, 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 averting of future crises um, um, and um, uh, achieving the kind of accountability from these G20 uh, efforts. Uh, and just my last contribution uh, to this whole thing about what should uh, this be, the you know, G20, G8, I always think this is a, you know, th this is really a G whiz question. And uh, this has been a pretty gee whiz uh, afternoon, too. Does anyone like to address the utilizing the WTO? I know we have many people that have worked extensively on those issues. Just a, just a very quick comment. Mm -hmm. uh, in 
Washington, we made the protectionism pledge, but we did not seize an organization with monitoring it. That was a mistake. Uh, in London, that mistake was remedied. And uh, the WTO was seized with responsibility. The question is, and Ambassador Hills, you know, you, you may wish to speak to this, there's a certain ambivalence on the part of member organizations as to the, whether they want the secretariat whacking them and publicly naming and shaming them. Uh, and so uh, I personally think it's a good idea uh, that we need a robust and rigorous review uh, and uh, not clothed in diplomatic language. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. The WTO did just issue its second report, or perhaps third report, uh, indicating, I think the word uh, used was slippage. Uh, thank you. Andrei Sitov from TAS from Russia. How do you see the uh, international position of the U.S. and uh, the, of the dollar uh, changing as a result of the current crisis? Uh, the question is for all of you. Thank you. Jeff, do you want to take that as a, as a financial expert? Well, I say it is, uh, too, as somebody who started his career in the Fed in the 1970s, and we were all worried about the decline <coughs> of the dollar then. We had some problems. <coughs> you know, the world is changing. Um, the Euro, Euro area is about as big an economic area as the U.S. is now. There's a logic that there should be some rebalancing of roles there. China is emerging as an important economic weight as well, but is far from being able to have a currency that plays an international role, given both its its market structures and, and, and its uh, closed borders. But if one looked ahead many, many years, uh, one could see greater diversification. I don't see... And there have been changes in the past, and there may be changes, there may not be in the future. I don't see this as being cataclysmic uh, or leading to any kind of a, of a crisis. I think it's a, it's a normal evolution. Uh, I do think the U.S. economy will come back from this and will continue to uh, earn a place as an, an important place where people will want to use our currency, but maybe not the only one. <laughs> I, I agree with what Jeff say, said, and I just add two points. One, internationally, um, it is important to address this longstanding issue of global imbalances. Herb Stein once said, if something can't go on forever, it won't, and, and this is an example, I think, of, of that. And that's, there is action for all countries on that score. Certainly part of the action for the United States going forward is, is addressing long-run fis fiscal sustainability. Thank you. Uh, Charles Harris, Yomir Shimbun. Uh, my question is on the uh, IMF voting shares. Um, what will be the strategy from the uh, U.S. side? Um, will, they, uh, will there be a push for larger shares for developing countries? Um, and if so, what kind of resistance will um, we see from the European countries to that? I know it's a very difficult topic. Both the last administration and this administration expressed strong commitment for reform of the international financial institutions to accord proportionate weight to uh, the representatives of the major emerging markets, yes, even at the expense of the Europeans. Uh, as Jeff explained, this is slow and painful, uh, but I think uh, this administration is committed uh, to moving that forward. I think we had a question right up here in the front on the right-hand side. Michael Martin from um, Congressional Research Service. I want you to address perhaps the role of being Sherpas in terms of two sources of criticism of the sort of GX process in general. One, as the earlier panel talked about, there's sort of a trade-off sometimes between the depth at which you can examine an issue and the breadth of the parties involved in the issue. So do you want a G8, which may be smaller and more depth, or a G20, which gives you more breadth? I would add to that also scope of the issues addressed. Um, Mr. Edson, you, you talked about moving 
APEC, for example, beyond the economic focus. There's now criticism of that in, in light, saying it's kind of mission creep, moving beyond the scope of what the organization was identified to do. So looking within a particular GX formation, balancing depth, breadth, and scope of the agenda. Outside of it, some people have been critical of sort of the amount of effort going in prior in the preparation work and then the post-event fatigue basically preventing the existing institutions from really addressing the day-to-day -day work that they need to do. As you sort of go from summit to summit to summit and never really can get into the full implementation. So as Sherpas, could you comment a little bit about the balancing of depth, breadth, and scope of the G summits? And then second, what about this criticism of that the cost-benefit analysis of having events of this sort really doesn't merit continuing? Gary, do you want to take that? You saw a lot of iterations of the Jesus. They're good questions. I don't think of it in, necessarily in terms of depth, breadth, and scope. I, I think you've got to be honest about the core cap capability of these groupings. When I look at, when I look at trade issues, for example, I, I remember all the time everybody used to say, oh, we've got to deal with the trade issue at the G8. The G8 is not a good place to deal with trade issues. Um, you're not going to argue about agricultural subsidies and the formula for, for, for reductions in the G8. Leaders aren't going to do that. At most, it can give an, a political impetus to it and large political commitments. I actually agree that the place is the WTO for that. And what leaders can do is direct action there. On development issues, n not so much depth, breadth, as the group around the table. Um, when you're in a G20 meeting, the emerging powers act like recipient countries, not donor countries, and you have a sterile debate about development issues. If from, the, from the standpoint of G8 versus G20, for the development community and for the poorest countries, the G8, I think, remains the better forum. Uh, the, the, the G20 is really talking about the emerging powers in the middle and middle income countries. Uh, the plus for Africa is that South Africa is at the table. The minus for Sub-Saharan Africa is that South Africa is at the table. Um, in point of fact, the poorest countries got more of a voice and more of a hearing and their issues more attention in the G8 process than they've received in the G20 process. Climate change. I happen to think that what Dan did with the major economies process um, is the right grouping, and I think that Al was kind of alluding to maybe that's the group that comes together that makes some high-level level decisions that breaks through, breaks through to achieve at least some results in Copenhagen. So I think it's a question of the co countries around the table and having the right group to deal with those issues. Uh, the G8 has proven it can deal with, with detailed questions of uh, advanced ma passenger manifest uh, exchanges uh, and, and the details of HIV. The G20 has proven they can deal with financial stability forum issues. Um, it's the right group uh, around the table at the right time on the issues. It's not a question of depth and breadth, I don't think. Does anyone else want to comment on that? No. The one problem that we're creating, we keep talking about you know, things that are unstable eventually crack. The proliferation of the demands on the times of heads of state and government is really astounding. And one cannot go on much longer and have a president in this country who has a capacity to do what he has to do at home as president. Uh, and so th there is kind of a different geometry that would be nice for different issues, but somehow we do need to have some kind of overall uh, limit on how, on how much uh, travel we have for these, for these meetings. I worry more about that than I do about the preparation process. We can probably always find uh, different groups of Sherpas to do the preparation. Well, I think we'll take two last questions, and if we can group them together, um, maybe we'll go from the from the, the woman in the back, and then uh, well, actually we'll, I'll, I'll cheat and take three. I'll take the woman in the back, the man in the front, and then and then the, the gentleman in the in the far back on the right hand side. But if we could please quickly state one question, and we'll throw it up. We'll throw them all up to the Sherpas. Okay, Mindy Reiser uh, worked in Central Asia and United Nations. I'd like to hear about those who are not at the table. The last comment began to talk about that, the developing countries who rely on spokespeople who may not be their spokespeople. Mm -hmm. And how does this all affect the dialogue and the decision making such that it is in the United Nations? People here talked about highs and lows, troughs and summits. How does the United Nations and its processes and its affiliated agencies fit into all of this? Great. And then we've got a question right here. 
Barry Wood, a freelance economics correspondent. Dan, you spoke about um, a year ago when Mr. Sarkozy and Mr. Loss, uh, Mr. Uh, Brown came to Camp David. What kind of forum did they want? And in starting a G20 as a, as a group, which now includes Spain and others, haven't you put in process something that may be too cumbersome to be effective? How are we going to get consensus as time goes on among these disparate countries, particularly when you have so many around the table, time they give speeches, there's not really much time left. Yeah, and then finally, at the back of it, it's Bill Helke. Uh, Bill Helke from the Federal Reserve. Uh, as Jeff knows, this question will be for him. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jeff mentioned both uh, institutional reform and uh, the great growth in China and how large China is. As Jeff well knows, we have three important institutions in international finance, capital mobility, independent monetary policy, and fixed exchange rates. Okay? Our beloved co-author has described the relationship between uh, the U.S. and China as the new Bretton Woods. Now, I recall you as a close observer in 1971 to 74 and 75 as we were going off Bretton Woods and the problems. Uh, would you agree with me that it's time to go off this new Bretton Woods since uh, China is too large to be on a fixed exchange rate? Or would you agree with Mike that uh, this is not the appropriate time uh, to go off this? And I would, as a footnote, say I believe that most of the financial or a great part of the, of the instability in asset prices in 2008 were due to the codependence of monetary policy in U.S. and China and the inconsistent policies being taken. Why don't, why don't the first two first that kind of deal with who's around the table? I think it's an interesting question based on Gary's comments about when you select a country to represent a region, you know, like as South Africa for Africa or Egypt for the Islamic world and, and how that plays out. So it, would anyone like to tackle those? And, and then the mechanics of can you have a successful operation with 20 countries around the table? Anyone would like to address I tend to think of these G groupings as sort of efforts to discover where a solution to a global problem might lie. They are not global legislatures, and the fact that a country or a group of countries isn't there doesn't mean that they've sort of lost their vote or representation. Obviously, there needs to be vigorous outreach. Um, obviously, you need to listen carefully, but you don't use them to make decisions. You use them to test. Uh, whether a solution may be possible. And when I was in government and would have groups come in and complain to me a little bit about the WTO green room process or some other smaller grouping, I'd say, say, well, look, look at what goes on in the, the Congress. There's always small groupings, that, caucuses working. Uh, they said, well, yeah, but that's different. And I'd say, well, what about your own organizations, whether it's a religious organization or, you know, this is the way that you find where a solution may lie. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but I haven't found an organization that doesn't have a process somewhat similar to it, at least an organization that actually works. Anyone else on the structure and inclusion before we turn to Bretton Woods? Bretton Woods, I believe that was directed at you. Well, I... My good friend and former co-author, Mike Dooley, is, is one of the fathers of this idea we have a new Bretton Woods and, and we ought to keep it. And I look at it and we had an old Bretton Woods and it didn't work very well and it broke down. Uh, and I've taken his analysis as being absolutely right but thought it pointed to a problem that we have. Uh, I, there, I have thought that the monetary history of my career, which began at the Fed in 1972, could be summarized as the U.S. dealing with a series of countries or regions that emerged from backwardness or war damage and who had exchange rates that were appropriate for that environment, who were uh, slow or reluctant to adjust to a new reality when they were a full, strong economy. And uh, as uh, the economic uh, data shows very clearly, uh, need a stronger real exchange rate. First it was Germany, then it was the rest of Europe, then it was Japan, then it was Korea, then it's Taiwan, now it's China. It is the same old process. And I don't see it any, you know, it's just, and it's a natural process and a natural evolution. Uh, it doesn't take place overnight, uh, but I think, uh, you know, it will take place. It had started before the crisis. Uh, 
uh, with more rapid adjustment of the Chinese exchange rate. I'm not surprised that in the middle of the world falling apart, <coughs> that the Chinese authorities, you know, kind of stopped for a while. Uh, but I think uh, economic uh, forces are going to lead to this process continuing again, and it was an important part of this talking about trying to achieve more balanced growth going forward. Anyone else or any closing comments? Yeah. Gordon Brown was not at the Camp David meeting. It was Sarkozy and Barroso Sorry. as a factual Sorry. matter. Not that that had any, you know, impact uh, on the outcome. I explained why the President decided to hold it at G20. I think your question is, is the group too cumbersome? Is it too big? Do you have the right? It was the right group for November 2008. I think it was also the right group for April 2009 and for September 2009. Whether that continues to be the right group, I don't know. Good point. Good point. Well, I want to I hope you all will join me in thanking our Sherpas who have done such great service to the country and, and really were insightful on all the issues today. Thank you very much.